Welcome to Artificially Intelligent Marketing, a weekly podcast where we stay on top of the latest trends, tips, and tools in the world of marketing AI, helping you get the best results from your marketing efforts. Now let's join our hosts, Paul Avery and Martin Broadhurst. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Artificially Intelligent Marketing, a podcast for marketers looking to use AI to help them be more efficient, more effective as marketers, really. I'm joined today by my very good friend, Martin. Martin, how are you? I'm very well. Just trying to keep my head above water with all of the AI news going on in the world at the moment. I feel like I am drowning in it. I think we broke WhatsApp this week. (laughs) Um, Or at least you broke my fingers trying to reply to your WhatsApps. Um, Yeah, crazy deluge. Some of the stories that we're going to be featuring today were released a handful of hours ago. And it feels like at this point, you'd need to do a new podcast episode every day to try and keep up with all of these bits and pieces. But you've had a good week overall. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Excited for tomorrow, actually. I'm doing my first AI marketing presentation, seminar, call it what you will, at a conference, uh, first one of 2023. So I'm looking forward to that. That's at Pride Park in Derby, uh, Digital Marketing Conference and Expo. Yeah, looking forward to Good stuff. Sounds exciting. First for me this week as well, not work-related, I took my little puppy to puppy training for the first time today. Little Pippin was learning to uh, sit and down and stand and recall and mostly did a real good job. He's a, he's a whippet, so he's a little bit scared of all the other dogs at the moment, but very, very sweet. And it was lots and lots of fun. So, uh, yeah. Pippin, lovely name as well. Pippin, he's, he's had four or five names during his life, none of which he responded to. He was like, I'm not interested in that. Pippin, he's quite happy with. Uh, I love the Lord of the Rings, so I'm quite happy to go down that route. And Scotty Pippin was one of my favourite basketball players from back in the day when I was young. So it all just fit together. Um, right, let's get through this inaneness and into the stuff that all of you lovely people are here to hear about. Um, let's talk about what's been happening in the world of marketing and AI. And this week, we got a lot. Firstly, GPT-4, as predicted last week, did come out. It came out even earlier than we thought it was going to. And so we've got some great info to go into on that. As well as that, Google provided an announcement of what they are planning to do by baking AI into all of their um, work-based tools. And then Microsoft as well coming in with Copilot a few hours ago. So we're going to go into those. We're also going to talk about a... Uh, a couple of tools we've been playing with, um, one called DID, which is which is quite fun and maybe could show the future of website chat. We'll look at that later. And then, we'll, of course, we'll have our tool of the week, which we're going to not tell you what it is until we get to it, because we're that excited um, to show you some of the stuff that we've been playing with. So let's go into story one. GPT-4, it's alive. It's alive. Right, you've been playing, Martin. Tell us, t- tell us, tell everyone what's going on first. Why, why GPT four three three point five chat GPT? Ah, tell us what GPT four is. The latest iteration of the general processing transformer uh, large language model of OpenAI. Have I got GPT right? Have I got the the words right there? I don't know. Anyway, it's the new iteration of. Uh, the, the the engine really that powers the interfaces like chat gpt so gpt4 widely anticipated people have been talking about the number of parameters basically how powerful it is going from 175 billion to a trillion 100 trillion and it's come out now and openai haven't told us how big it is so that was a really interesting observation when they announced it straight off the bat it was a very different tone in their announcement it was much more we've done this cool thing and this is what we've done to it and this is what it can do but we're not going to tell you how we've done it that no secrets no mm. secrets revealed and there's been a little bit of uh angst on the twitter spheres about that yeah, yeah. open ai not being quite as open perhaps as they uh as used to be absolutely not it's uh it's like google's don't be evil motto all of a sudden you know, they just pivot away from from that. You know, previously we were an open AI research company. We're going to share. We want artificial general intelligence. And then all of a sudden, oh, actually, no, sorry. We're going to be a profit-based company. But we're going to put a profit cap on it. It's 100 times. So if we invest a billion, we're going to make 100 billion. You know, That's it. But we're just going to cap it there. 
Just that's it. That's enough. We know our limits. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, just the GDP of a small country. We'll just cap it there, though, and then we'll go buy a country. It's all good. Use AI to take over. And I think, actually, that's something that they could probably do. GPT-4 is pretty powerful. It's quite, um, it's quite impressive. The announcement, one of the first things that they said is that it's uh, multimodal. So we discussed this last week. What does that actually mean? Is it going to input? Are you going to be able to input video and text and it output video and text? Well, it's... It's an input multimodal. Input multimodal. You can use this for you to say. <laughs> you can input images along with a text-based prompt. And what's incredibly powerful about this is that it it has some incredible capabilities to understand those images that that you put in. The outputs are all text-based, so there's still no integration with the likes of Dali or any um, video capabilities or anything like that sure that will come in gpt5 or something like that but for now text-based and that's uh really quite powerful some great examples uh, i'm sure you've seen a few of them the chicken nugget tray was a was a brilliant one didn't you see that tell us that i didn't see that so the chicken nugget tray was a, a baking tray with chicken nuggets laid out in a kind of map of the world um like chicken nuggets you got the making of North America and South America and mm -hmm. Antarctica and all the rest of it. And it's asked to explain why this, basically explain this meme photo. And it does, it explains it and says, this is funny because uh, it's trying to, because oh, uh, I think the meme picture across the top said the beauty of uh, Earth from space, looking at the magnificence of, of Earth from space. But it explains it in really great detail. It says, you know, it sets you at the bottom of the, in the description, it says it sets you up thinking that it's going to be this great, profound, beautiful image. And actually it's just something mundane and chicken nuggets. So it knows, it gets context. It, it has much more relevancy and an appreciation of the world. Another example, a photo of uh, someone holding balloons on helium and the helium filled balloons on string. And the prompt said, what would happen if the string was cut? And it said, the balloons would fly away. So not just able to interpret accurately what the image is, but also to bring logic into inferring next stages in a story, for example. Well, that's quite impressive. I think my favourite was the one... There's been riffing on this, but my favourite was probably the one that was in the demo, that the development demo that was shown on YouTube shortly after the news, where uh, the person presenting had drawn a sketch for a simple website they wanted to build a joke website took a picture of the sketch fed it into gpt4 and said give me the code that i would need to actually code this website gpt spits out the html you render the html and you get this website with that's a joke website um and even has clickable buttons to reveal you know javascript clickable buttons to reveal the punchlines to the jokes the hand-drawn script, I mean, it was better than I could do, but it wasn't great, right? And it, somehow... It was, it was the... People talk about low-fidelity <laughs> wireframes. It was the lowest of low-fidelity wireframes. It was a box with... So, I mean, the text, you could barely... The text was barely legible. It had... Like, what I thought was really impressive as well, actually, was he'd text... The, the text that he'd written, he'd put in brackets where that was kind of placeholder text. And it had understood that was placeholder text and inserted it and replaced it with real text. It it was, in, it, yeah, that was... Assuming that's all real, right, and it's not been manufactured, that was pretty cool, right? Yeah, totally. That was like, all of a sudden you went, holy, holy cow, that is quite something. So what else does it have? It's multimodal. It, can, um, it has this enhanced reasoning that, like we said a moment ago with the example with the, the balloons, if you can actually access this uh, this model through ChatGPT Plus at the moment, so I've been playing around with it, and it's quite interesting the kind of subtleties because um, it it's also billed as being more concise. And having played with it quite a bit, it will output quite a lot, but it is more concise. It gets to the point in each section. So if you ask it to write a blog, it's less. And not that GPT three was particularly waffly, but the the, the writing's tighter. Yeah. It's more succinct. It's more to the point. It's more, it's more on point as well. Actually, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's really quite surprising that. 
they talk about it having improved safety and alignment, uh, but don't really go much more in into how that is. And that's a, a point of contention for some people. And again, private company, why do they get to set the rules mm-hmm. on what is allowed, what is harmful content, what is not harmful content? I'm sure that will all come out of the wash um, now in the wash over the next few months then years there's more people get involved in that that discourse so i'm not too concerned personally there i think open ai tended to be quite responsible in the way that they've put prod- the mod- models out there and they've been quite quick to adapt i think we saw that with chat gpt when it was released but one of the most interesting elements of this other than the multimodal for me is the longer input text we've taken it from being able to handle with chat gpt about 3000 words and it's suddenly gone up to 25,000 words. So the amount of uh, data you can add into a prompt has just shot through the roof. It's really quite significant. And that opens up the doors for much more, you know, in terms of practical applications as marketers or content marketers, you have being able to take transcripts of podcasts like ours and just stick them in and get your show summaries done in a click, you're not having to break it up into smaller pieces. If you're doing research, that is going to enable you to put whole documents in there and, and find key takeaways. Mm. There's a myriad of use cases for this, but I think that one is really, really quite exciting. Yeah, I'd agree. I've been pl- having quite a play as well. Um, I um, I got a really good book outline out of it. I'm not going to share what the book's about because I actually think I might see if I can produce it really quickly as like a an example. And maybe talk about it, you know, next week's podcast or the podcast after. But I, I gave it a really challenging book concept, um, based on, without giving too much away, based on things like the hero's journey, mm-hmm. and it did a really, really good job of taking something super abstract and somehow squeezing that into a hero's journey character arc, which I was really impressed about. I started to get it to write it, and by chapter four, it had kind of forgotten what it'd written about in chapter one. So it knew the characters still, but it wasn't consistent with some of the things that had happened to the character in chapter one. And the chapters, I called them chapters, they were like 800 words max, right? Like this was not a book. Um, so I think the strategy you'd have to go through, and I did, I saw someone, I um, can't remember who it was, had, had written a whole book of 250 pages and it required 2,000 prompts. And that doesn't surprise me because I think if you really want to produce that type of long form content and have it be coherent, you you're almost say you want to produce a book chapter, you really iteratively prompting every section. Um, and maybe even I think giving it, even it should remember giving it a bit of context for each section or for each chapter. So it doesn't forget, um, what it's supposed to be writing about. But, um, but I was pretty impressed compared to when I ran the same test with GPT three, like GPT three, three's, um, chat GPT, the original version, the book concept didn't work. It just couldn't, it couldn't interpret what I meant. Um, I also really loved, and I thought was a great demonstration, um, uh, Paul Reutzer from the Marketing AI Institute showed a, a post on LinkedIn where he asked uh, GPT-3-driven chat GPT or GPT-3.5 to give him an out-of-office, a, a creative out-of-office, like a humorous out-of-office, and then he asked GPT-4 to do it. And the difference is night and day. And I have, I found this myself, even when prompting ChatGPT to be like really creative. Like I had it right in social media posts where the prompt was, be so creative and persuasive, you offend me. Like I was asking it <laughs> to be provocative. I, was, I wanted it to say things like, you're a shit marketer and you don't know what you're doing. And if you don't read this blog post, your career will be over forever. And I could never get it to get anywhere near that provocative or creative. But this, uh, and I should say, <laughs> Paul Wright says it's not angry and aggressive. <laughs> but it is um, a great example of the difference because whether you like the output from GPT-4 or not, it is incredibly creative. It's like, hi, Earthlings, I'm away speaking with robots at AI conferences. Like, it is really, really, really creative which i just couldn't get out of gpt3 so yeah as content marketers this is a massive upgrade i think for a variety of different reasons in terms of its reasoning ability it's almost like knowledge of topics and ability to speak about them the fact it's more concise the fact that 
It really understands the prompts that you give it better than than the old model did. So much cool stuff there. Um, if you if you've if you're a marketer or you work in content marketing and you've played with Chat GPT, you need to play with Chat GPT four because I think you will see a big difference. And if you're a content marketer and you haven't played with either yet, you're you're going to be obsolete pretty quick if you don't start to learn how to manipulate these tools to get a decent first draft out don't get me wrong i still think heavy editing is required i still think if you want things with genuine novel insight you as the human have to bring the insight to the party um but yes these things are getting crazy powerful very quickly and that's coming through in the benchmarks that they're they're showing the capabilities of chat gpt or gpt 3.5 i think it could in terms of that one of the big um kind of domain areas was was law and in america passing the bar is the kind of big example everyone's just passing the bar can it pass the bar and i believe chat gpt or gpt3 had about a 10 percent kind of pass rate um it, it wasn't I, I think it was able to Against humans, it was in the bottom ten percent of the, of scores. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. is that what it was? I, I wasn't sure of the. Um, whereas this is now in the top ninety percent. Is that yeah? Right? It scores in the top. Yeah, in the top ninety percent, which is, you know, that's quite incredible. <laughs> and it I didn't say across so many domains as well. Um, I, thought I saw some in the life sciences. There was some. Uh, one of the examples that somebody put on Twitter was about, we were talking about bio GPT in last week's episode, mm -hmm. talking about the drug discovery capabilities or the drug um, interaction capabilities of uh, of GPT-4 that people have been playing with. I was like, wow, that's, you know, it's not trained on this, but it's capable of doing it. Well done. Yeah. I mean, it must be sucking that out of some training material somewhere. I think the, the exam thing's interesting, and I honestly haven't probed how they do it deep enough to to say, but one criticism would be training something to take a specific test is potentially quite easy, right? Even humans know how to gain certain tests to get a good mark, in you know, for some tests, right? Um, so in some areas, I'm not super surprised, but it was the massive jump for some of the, t like you were saying, like for the bar exam, GPT-3 sucked at some. Like it it was at 0% for a couple of the tests. And if you look out there, um, lovely listeners, you'll find there's a bar chart floating around the interwebs that shows, I don't know, 20-odd tests where GPT-3 scores, where GPT-4 scores. And it really is those ones where GPT-3 sucked, but GPT-4 is like way better than most humans, not just better than GPT-3. I actually had... Uh an issue this week a consumer rights issue shall we say um and i thought i don't know how to to tackle this one and oh i, I just thought you know what i'm going to throw it into gpt4 and see what it says and i kind of set it up with that you are an expert in uk consumer law with domain expertise in this particular area and i kind of explained the situation i bullet pointed key points and tried to keep it as fact-based as possible and ask it to give me advice and then write a letter to the company that I was engaging with and then provide me with kind of next steps uh, strategy. That was fascinating. First off, the letter that it wrote, it had the address of the company on the letter. I told it the name of the company and that it was in Derby and it put the company's full address, their, their real address on there. It's pretty so, that's a thing that it can do um because it can't access the internet still right you know but it's obviously got within its corpus of training data lots of business directories and things like that right yeah um so it'd be worth sticking biostrata in and seeing i'm see about it. to ask it what the address is yeah and then um and then so in the strategy actually in the kind of like what should i do it gave it gave six potential kind of next steps but in each one, it gave like how likely that is to get me the resolution that I was after. So it would it was said, you know, you could there's this breach of contract, there's mis-selling, 
you could raise a complaint with the FCA, you could do this, you could do that. But it gave a detailed kind of explanation. Like the last one, for instance, it said um, you could take legal action through a legal professional, but this could get expensive and still want. So that was a really obvious kind of answer. But the ones earlier were quite specific and, and nuanced, I would say. I guess your only danger there is we know that ChatGPT can churn out absolute junk that's completely incorrect. So I can imagine a use case for this. The danger for you as a consumer is you still need someone with a legal background to check that and make sure it's not nonsense, I guess. But at least it arms you with the right things to go speak to about with it, you know, with an expert. Uh, yeah, one hundred percent. And again, is it always that kind of human in the loop element to it? What I would say is that I did check some of the details because I thought is that right? And it gave gave reference to Consumer Rights Act twenty fifteen and pulled out relevant sections of it, and that was quite powerful. Right. And what it gave me was, I would say, a starting point, a far better jumping off point than I would have got doing my own research. It saved me a hell of a lot of time. Um, and potentially, I can imagine a scenario where I go to a solicitor and say, you know, this is my current situation. This is my understanding of it. And you save yourself a six hundred pound bill just by not having to spend the first hour explaining everything. Yeah, agreed. Pretty cool, right? I think we've probably waxed lyrical enough on GPT four, seeing as we've got a ton more of other stuff to get through. Let's talk about Copilot, which came out a handful of hours ago. Um, so take us through it, Martin. Why it's important for marketers? Well, uh, the productivity suite that we all use, we all know, we all love. We used to have. Clippy in Microsoft Word, but now yeah. we have Copilot. And he's Copilot definitely feels like Clippy on steroids. Clippy has evolved, taken new form, and is now making our lives much easier. Before we get into the detail of it, I just want to say one thing. In the promotional video, there was a two minute promotional video, and then there was the longer kind of keynote session. In that session, Jared Spataro, the Corporate Vice President, Modern Work and Business Applications at Microsoft, he said at one point, at best, work not only feeds our families, it feeds our souls. And at that point, I felt what I thought was my soul leaving my body. <laughs> it was a little bit of vomit in my mouth. I just I, I can see he's doing it to you now, just remembering the event. So I couldn't I couldn't hack it. I thought like, No, don't say that. That's awful. Anyway, uh enough of the uh the cringe. Copilot looks pretty cool. Yeah, so they've baked uh GPT four and large language mod I do it looks like they might be introducing I'm guessing some of their own as well. I'm not sure I've I've not read that they have done Specifically, but I wouldn't be surprised. Well, this is yeah. off the presses as well, so we'll probably learn more in the next couple of days. Yeah, this came out literally six, five, five six hours ago. Um, so trying to get ahead around it all very quickly. It's baked into the whole ecosystem. So Word, Outlook, Excel, all of it has it baked into it. And what's interesting is it all works together. I thought the presentation that they did uh, was incredibly powerful. So in short, they'd say that it works with all of the apps. It turns natural language prompts into productivity actions, unleashes creativity, unlocks productivity, and up-level skills. So what can it do? Well, it generates content, automate tasks, and provides relevant data and insights. So it's enterprise-ready as well. So they say that it protects uh, the tenant, the group, and the individual data. So it's very secure. It's designed to be rolled out at enterprise level. There's no gonna, not going to be any data leakage. It's all contained within your uh, instance, within your license. And so, so this is critical, quiet. right? Because people have been super worried in larger companies about putting things into chat GPT. Like, let's say I want some help uh, editing a press release for an upcoming product that's going to change the world. Well, clearly that's important commercially sensitive news. I can't p copy and paste the press release into chat GPT. I don't know where that's going or who's seeing that. So incredible sensitivity and risk aversion for larger companies. I I've heard stories of GPT 
um, chat GPT has even been blocked in a lot of companies because they're like, we don't know where the data goes. We don't know who can see the information. None of you are allowed to use it. So the fact that then Microsoft can do this within their privacy frameworks that they're ideally, and I, I guess would have to be held accountable to, frameworks that probably most of us were already signed up to, even in large enterprise, should open the door for those companies that didn't feel comfortable having having um, their employees use tools where they didn't know where their data was going. I guess the only thing would be, you know, you use a Jasper or a copy.ai or, or a writer, which all rely on open AI. Microsoft also relies on open AI. So yes, there's all these privacy things in place, but where does the data really go? Are they still going to use it to train further models and all this stuff, right? Well, Microsoft actually have access to the code, don't they? They have the model themselves. If nobody else has access to that spare $10 billion deal. Right. Everyone else can access it through the API. Microsoft has the thing itself. So, so. it's enclosed, right? I didn't realize that. That's uh, yeah. That helps answer that question. Thank you, Mark. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Come back anytime. Uh, so what else do they uh, talk about? It's integrated into uh, all of the apps in a way that gives this consistent user experience. And uh, they've said that it's built on responsibility with uh, AI principles and ethical AI standards kind of at the, the heart of it, which you would expect them to say. It does look smart. I thought the demo was great. You also saw the same demo as me. There's a particular example halfway through the presentation where they take you through um, like the process, your graduation of, of the presenter's daughter. She's graduating and it takes you through sending the invites through to the creation of the presentation that you would have playing at the party with embarrassing photos and all of that kind of thing. I thought I thought that was incredibly powerful. That I need to stop, stop saying incredibly. It's it, that's just how I feel about it at the moment. The what was quite smart was the in the chat conversation. It understood the context, so you could say, "Send an email invite for daughter's sixteenth birthday party to family and friends," and it would draft the email invite, but taking in context from other emails like the venue booking confirmation email that you've got. So it would integrate the party time and date and location into the message. That is so cool. And then they give a, a business example as well, didn't they, where you're emailing a colleague and assuming you've got all of your documents on your SharePoint, you can associate a document with that email, but have Copilot automatically pull the context from that document to fill the email. So it might be that you need to send over the actions from a call. Well, that's easily pulled from the transcription in Teams that's already been saved. And by the way, if you need to flag to them that they should go and have a look at uh, the the PowerPoint decks, of, you know, describing the value proposition of the new product, oh, please, Copilot, can you pull out um, the benefits, features, and, and proof points out of the deck and just add them as bullets in the email? Yeah, cool, no problem. It goes into the deck, knows semantically what, important bits it should pull out pops them in the email as well like it's kind of mad when you think about the sheer range of possibilities for how much faster you can do things one of the points that there's a nice little quote and i thought that describes my experience of using powerpoint and uh, the presenter she said the average user uses 10 percent of powerpoint copilot unlocks the other 90 percent and i thought yes it's the same with all of the microsoft suite there's so much power in it, but I just scratched the surface of it. And this is the same with nearly everybody that I know. Just, it can do so much, but you just do the same things time and again. The presentation example where it pulled in images automatically from a folder and then created the, the deck and you edit the text, that it automatically created a few tweaks and it would make it smarter. And it looks beautiful, let's be honest. It just oh. didn't even look like a junk presentation. Whatever template it pulled from, I don't know if it uses branded templates on your SharePoint or if they're built into PowerPoint already, but it looked mustard. It did. With, with animations that didn't look cheesy, with transitions that didn't look cheesy, it looked modern, contemporary, it looked smart. How much time in agencies, in marketing departments, in design departments, how much time is spent putting together the PowerPoint? I'm working on a deck. 
right? The content's there. The content's there in somebody's head, in other documents, in other areas. There was meeting notes. There's this, that, the other. Someone has to go and sit and create that deck. People will spend hours pulling a deck together. If that can now be done in minutes, you know, relative, relatively speaking, you know, 10, 15 minutes rather than three hours or something, that's a huge time saver. It's an process. Yeah. I... In the life science industry, we, because we deal with such technical and complex subject matter and the products that we're talking about, showing the applications of, talking about the benefits, features, applications, and all that good stuff, it's usually very complicated. And the subject matter experts are usually working with the PhD scientists, very detail oriented people who can who love the wizardry of the technology that they've built or that they're using and go into a great amount of detail, a bit like I'm doing now. Can you tell I'm an ex-scientist as well? Um, because of that, their PowerPoints can massively suffer, right? Like 52 bullets on a page, <laughs> basically inviting people to read full prose on slides. But now if there's, it's almost like there's a magic button that you can press that's going to distill all that key information into something that's going to be much more digestible for people to, to you know, to uh, if you're at. presenting, they will focus on you, the presenter. Exactly. But that, that, as you said, rightly is at the moment, you know, the domain of the marketing department, the domain of the agency, there is absolutely a number of important skills required to go from dense technical output, because to be honest, so there's, there's reasons the subject matter experts think and act like that it's because the majority of their job requires them to be like that mm. right on the on the few occasions they have to create a powerpoint th you, this is what you get and you know they're not m most subject matter experts don't create enough powerpoints to even warrant spending an hours and hours and hours of training to try and be, be a good graphic designer or content summarizer or value proposition creator it's just not a good use of their time but that used to be the marketing department and now is it potentially a button who knows? I, th I think until we get to play with it and really see how good it is at extracting key information and associating appropriate visuals and all that stuff, we have to wait and see, but it's certainly a step in that direction, isn't it? Yeah, huge potential. I did like during the presentation, they were very heavy on this is a starting point. It's, the, it's designed to give you a starting point. This is about augmenting human work and not replacing human work. They were very big on that, and I, and I think that really comes across in the way that the UI of the tool is as, as well. Mm. Well, still very much in control. This is not, you know, going to replace you, but it's going to allow you to to get stuff on a page quicker. Yeah, I agree. Copilot's a good name. Um, member of our team, Tom, very smart guy. We when we started talking about AI and supporting tools, you know, back when we began testing them, he said. We're going to all have to become very good pilots. And I just really thought that was a great way of phrasing it because you look at a modern plane, it can do a lot of things automatically, but there's so many edge case scenarios where you need the human in the loop. And I don't even think the AIs that we're going to be using for a lot of these creative use cases are anywhere near as good as the automation in an airplane, to be honest, because I think there's way more edge cases in real life and across all these complex domains that the AIs are trying to help us with, at least in the marketing industry. So co-pilot is a good word because we are the pilot and we can get help and we could be more efficient, more effective. I think, again, it would be great for getting things going. And in the example that you described um, in that Microsoft presentation, the, the raw text that's put in that PowerPoint, um, the lady who presents, I can't remember her name, she edits it, right? It's not in her voice. She's like, no, I wouldn't say that like that. So she edits it. And that's exactly how I expect it to be for some time, if not forever, because at least at the moment, um, they don't know what's in our heads, right? Um, although if our story from last week where you're an MRI it's and then it can think it's what you see, then maybe, uh, maybe not so. But yeah, it's um, Copilot's a good name. I think that's how we should all be looking at it for sure. And um, I can't wait to get my hands on it. So on that note, Google announced their own generative AI being baked into Google Workspace. But the way that I've just described it to you is Google has announced his own generative AI in the workspace. I haven't said Google Copilot or whatever. Have they missed a trick? 100%. Trying to get your head around exactly what Google's product 
AI infusion is going to look like is hard because from the news announcements, they don't go into any detail. And Microsoft are way ahead. I think this is Google's attempt to go, oh, we've got one. Oh, oh we're going to do it. Uh, and we better tell you so that you think we're still cool. And holy moly, right, team, we need and to we're do it on the same day that GPT-4 is announced and we're going to launch it a few hours early. Quick, get that two-minute promo video done. You make a massively good point because um, we I was talking about this um, with some of the team today after, after Copilot was announced. You can't, as an enterprise not access the power of of this like if you're on google apps if google don't give you this within three months of microsoft bringing it out even if you've got a two or three year subscription to google still going it's worth binning that off and just transitioning everything over to microsoft because the, the sheer time savings and efficiencies and productivity gains you'll get from having ai embedded into all your tools and connected all to, you, to all your data so google are now you know there's a fuse burning a mission impossible star bum 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 right and it is getting quite close to the bit where everything goes boom and they really really need to get to the party quickly they do and it does look like their promo video addresses much of the the similar things that we've talked about in fact on the on the example that they give they have um ai baked into the gmail system You've come to a threaded email conversation late, lots of emails in that thread. It then summarizes that thread for you. It turns the the, the summary into a campaign brief. It's all about a marketing campaign. It turns it into a campaign brief in a, in a Google Doc. It turns the campaign brief into a slide deck in Google Slides. And it's that, you know, look how smooth this whole process is. But all you see is that that, that two minute video, the equivalent of the one that... Um, but it didn't get it, it didn't get me excited, and yeah, it way. and it lacked the polish, and it didn't it didn't have this feel of something transformational is coming. Now you and I nerd out about this a lot and have done for a long time, but I thought Microsoft approach really got people excited. And as much as it was uh, feeds our families and feeds our souls, a little bit cringeworthy at time. At least they made an event of it. They tried to make yeah. it more exciting. So, yeah. Google, you need to start exciting us. Yeah, very much so. Right. Um, we This is going to be one of our longer episodes, but there's been loads of good stuff to talk about. Let's look at a couple of quick things um, just that we saw this week and we didn't want to make it all um, enterprise level baked in AI tools, did we, Martin? So very quickly, we were playing with a couple of tools. Uh, let's talk about Adept first. There was a, um, a company that got $350 million in funding this week called Adept that is a generative ai that takes natural language input and turns it into action so this is a bit different from what we've been talking about so far it's almost like it is being designed to be able to operate all the tools you already use for you so that when you ask things of it in natural language it can go do them so some of the examples that are given on the website are things like um, set a reminder for me to email this person find me a refrigerator for under a thousand dollars add a new column to this spreadsheet showing this, add this person to Salesforce and give me a reminder to follow up with them with the presentation. So in essence, multimodal, but in a different sense, like multi-ability to go access all the tools you already use, click buttons, take actions, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously that's a fairly big bet by the folks that have just chucked all that cash into Adept. Yeah, text to action as a as a generative AI, pretty cool. So, so that'll be fun. Yeah, I, I I can imagine you know sending a text message and all of a sudden my Excel reports are done and you know I was, it's when you start thinking about these things working together that your mind just kind of blows a little bit. You know, writing a prompt to Adept that then speaks to Copilot, Copilot goes off. And, does this thing for you? I don't. I think we'll write in a lot of instances, like if you're in a busy office. But honestly, we're going to be speaking to these tools. Uh, yeah, that's a, f a fair point, really. It's computer from Star Trek. That's where we're headed. Um, um, maybe not with the sort of super all-encompassing powers that are envisaged by when most people think of AGI, but with enough power, certainly for marketers and sales folk to be instructing their software platforms to go do things for them that usually would have required loads of manual input 
the click, 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 scroll, click, copy, paste, click, scroll becomes, hey, do this, please. And it's done. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. The other thing was we were playing with a tool called DID this week. Um, imagine like a near human looking avatar with a near human sounding voice that basically acts like GPT. So when we say near human and near uh, voices and look, it's kind of like Uncanny Valley style, like, yeah, looks human, but no, not quite. Um, sounds pretty human, but still a tiny bit robotic. Um, but you can ask it questions in, you know, natural language prompt. And rather than spitting out text, it speaks to you. So you could absolutely, as a marketer, imagine that replacing a chatbot on your website or even in, if you're in customer service, you know, a video customer service rep, even on the website or almost hosting some sort of video call with a customer. But the customer service rep is this animated avatar that looks kind of human-like and speaks like a human. I mean, that's kind of mind-blowing as well. And I know there's, man, we've talked about it before, there's quite a few companies out there trying to do similar things. But this was by far the easiest one I've played with. Like, I literally logged in, signed up, started giving it prompts and having conversation with it. Very different setup to a lot of the other um, AI avatar tools that I've used or seen. Synesthesia, I think, is one of the, the big ones in this. Yeah, nothing's about. I haven't seen that they're integrating anything with uh, chat GPT or any chat-based AI, but it, it, it's the next logical step for them. And obviously, it's happening within this space. I'm fascinated to know what the consumer response is going to be. When these are rolled out, how pe people are quite happy using chatbots and kind of live chat agents. They're, they're always quite closed, aren't they, at those? But as those get more powerful with chat GPT, they're going to be quite useful and functional. Slap a face on it. And <laughs> how are people going to interact? Are people going to hate to it? Are people going to have emotional response? No. I what do we do when we fall in love? Yeah, I fell in love with the chat agent on my Eon meter reading website. Oh, yeah, I love my uh, my latest iPhone. No, I, I really love my iPhone. <laughs> yeah. <Straight> into it. <laughs> right, moving quickly on. Um, tool of the week, sneaky. It's still GPT-4. We've come yeah. full circle. It is GPT-4. So I wanted to play around with this. There's some people that have been doing some cool projects on there someone made uh, a playable version of pong um, the the classic video game and i thought well wouldn't it be good if we could get the artificially intelligent marketing podcast to maybe have a new look and feel on the website maybe create a whole website now, the thing I want to stress about this is we started recording this. Uh, I think we jumped on the, the Zoom call at 8.30 p.m. I started this at seven minutes past eight. Okay, so you had 20 odd minutes to get to do what you've been doing. I had 23 minutes to get this to the point that it is at. And I'm, I'm just going to share the screen now. So for those of you listening... Uh, you don't get the benefit of this, but if you can uh, find the video, uh, you'll you'll see it. But this is uh, this is the first time Paul has seen it, so there you go. Ooh. So wait a minute, take us through the process for how you did this. So this is a three-page uh, website. This is and it works. All of these pages are actual pages. You'll see we've got the home page, the about page, and the contact us page. Contact us page has got a form on it. At the bottom, we've got a newsletter sign up with stay up to date, latest episodes, news and events. It's got a form with uh, an API connection. This doesn't actually work because I haven't put the API key for the email marketing platform. But once I drop in the API key, this will be connected to send in blue email marketing platform. And you can see it's got a home page. It's written all of the text. Um, it's got three buttons that link you out to listen on Apple Podcasts, listen on Spotify, listen on Amazon Music. It's got copyright notices and privacy policy. Whoa, 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 whoa. Right, okay. Tell us what you did. Yeah, so what I did, the starting point for this was <laughs> I actually asked it. I said, you're a world-class prompt engineer. <laughs> We're just and, talking to yourself there, Martin. And, what what and, did you say to ChatGPT? <laughs> I said to, to ChatGPT, you're a world-class prompt engineer. This is GPT-4, remember? So world-class prompt engineer and website developer. 
uh, write a prompt for ChatGPT to to write the website. So we actually ended up writing this very very detailed brief, um, a full written brief with um, you know so it was a very comprehensive brief. I thought it was very solid. I then took that brief and then popped it into a new chat and said, uh, "You're a world class website developer. Uh, your code is." neat, tidy, minimal, etc. Uh, you've been asked to design and develop a website following this brief. And then I asked it to to create that website. The interesting thing was its first response was to almost like write an email to me or, or write a long response to me saying, I've written your website. I've created your website. This is what I've done. Uh, I, <laughs> so it was the account manager. I like it. Was, it. Yeah, it was the account manager. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, he was going, it's this secure, I've added this to the page. And I was like, no, 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 I need the files to upload to the server. Send me each of the files now. And then it started writing the files. Um, so what I ended up getting was uh, three HTML files for the pages. I got, uh, I think it was two JavaScript files and one CSS file. And I was taken those and opened them in the browser really i mean it, it really is that that's basically what i've done there were some additional tweaks so um the the logo is actually the hosted logo from our website so i had to go back and tell it where to source the the, the that from so given it given it the address for the image a couple of other little things um that uh what else did i need to, to change i tried to get it to put some animation into the text and stuff couldn't quite get that working within within 20 minutes oh well that's highly disappointing what a waste of 20 minutes that you only built a website from scratch <laughs> code and design i mean that's i mean yeah for 20 minutes work it, it wrote all oh yeah that's it, it wrote all of the text what that, that's not even pulled off our existing website no this was this was text i asked it to to write all of, all of the text every everything was created by it i didn't do anything other than tell it the name was it it does make me sound way better than i really am i just saw that so yeah now now i understand that's just a really good example of its ability to produce junk yeah exactly i mean this says that you serve as the chief marketing officer at a leading tech company i do artificially intelligent marketing currently a podcast soon to be a tech company we're all tech companies these days isn't that right well, i think we you have to be but yeah that's what i thought i would, I would play around with the tool of the week this week it's um I, what's interesting actually is i stuck the same prompt into gpt into chat gpt with gpt 3.5 yeah and it was oh. just like old model it just went nope it said as a you know large language ai large language model i cannot create this but the, i can tell you the steps that you would need to do now i know it can create that or it can create web pages because at my presentation tomorrow i'm showing a, a an, an interactive functional game of noughts and crosses that chat gpt made for me and did a pretty good job of using the old model using the old model yeah, yeah correct um and it did that and i managed to edit it to get a logo and a button added in there with some different states on the button and stuff but but yeah this is this is and this is a level beyond that this is multiple pages created this is design text the lot it's kind of crazy right mark as we said at the beginning if you're not playing with these tools get playing gpt4 get playing because and, and be creative start googling around get on the twitters and figure out who's playing with this stuff because you'll be inspired by the examples that you see not only can it generate text outputs it can generate code it can do sums i saw uh, in the in the demo its ability to reason through someone's tax return um get creative an example was really smart actually. oh yeah it's mind-blowing like do my tax return for me and break out the logic that you needed to go through. And it even like sucked in some important legislative changes that were important for a particular time period. And blah, blah. anyway, mm. search that out as well. But yes, play with it, challenge it, challenge yourself. Look for examples online of where people are doing really out there things with this, because you probably do pretty cool things. I mean, people are using it to create apps at the moment. There's been a lot of that. 
somebody created an app that suggests five new movies to you every day that you should watch and they did that in like a half an hour or something crazy like if in terms of unleashing creativity and allowing you to finally come up with ideas for things that you wanted to do but lacked technical skills in specific domains this opens up a lot of doors we should say mine to go from raw html and javascript to what you then put together it's not super challenging but you need to know what you're doing right you can't just like paste html into your into the web browser bar at the top and now you've got a web page right like there's still things that you need to know how to do, but they're not the hard things. They're quite easily learned. Yeah, uh, and it if you know you where a little bit of knowledge can you can get a long way. And actually, if you don't know, you can ask it to explain it to you. That's the mm. thing that I think. Honestly, that's the thing that I think is is really remarkable because if you come at it completely. Admittedly, I couldn't do it in 21 minutes like I did with this or 23 minutes, whatever it was to create this website. But I'm very confident that I could create a Chrome extension from scratch. I, I would, right, if you were to ask me right now to create a Chrome extension, I wouldn't have a clue. Wouldn't know. I'm not a coder, not a developer. I wouldn't know where to start. But I reckon that with within a few hours with GPT-4, I could have a fully functional one up and running. Yeah. Well, you know what you've just done there, Martin. Will you please create a Chrome extension for us so that we can show the folks next week? That's that's a uh, challenge accepted. Mine's like crap. But yes. As, as if I've not got busy enough life <laughs> with a toddler. Just Things don't to be grumpy about. Just don't go watch Derby County. It's not good for yourself <laughs> anyway. We've already talked about this before. Um so there's there's like three or four hours backing up. Or take your laptop and just that would be even better. I was watching Derby <laughs> County, they were three nil down again. Uh, okay. so I created this Chrome extension uh, and accidentally commercialized it over the next two weeks and made two million dollars. That would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? We are playing Fleetwood Town this weekend, so um being three nil down could happen. I'd be better off listening to Fleetwood Mac. And with that, I think we'll end the podcast. I think we've probably talked quite enough nonsense for one week thank you so much for everybody for joining us again we really really appreciate it. hopefully you found this valuable if you did subscribe and if you did share it with your pals in marketing land we're getting loads of downloads we're loving it but we'd love more so please do share this far and wide if you think it's valuable other than that we will see you all next week martin thank you for your time as always i'll see you next week my friend see you next week cheers bye Thank you for listening to Artificially Intelligent Marketing. To stay on top of the latest trends, tips, and tools in the world of marketing AI, be sure to subscribe. We look forward to seeing you again next week.